Welcome to episode 16 of the Hunt Back Country podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. Tonight we're talking with Russ Meyer, who's maybe the greatest hunter that you've never heard of. Well, that's according to Steve anyway. Be sure to listen in to hear why. It's an awesome show and discussion with Russ. First things first, Dusty Alexander, you're this week's giveaway gear winner. Go ahead and email us your address to podcast at xomountaingear.com, and we're going to send you some swag. Listeners, if you want in on these weekly giveaways, it's simple. All you have to do is leave us a review on iTunes or send us your question and feedback to podcast at xomountaingear.com. All right, here's the show. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra tough packs that are designed to do what you love most hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Russ, welcome to the Hunt Pack Country Podcast. How are you, man? I'm doing good. Thank you. Good. Steve, how you doing tonight, buddy? Ah, uh, doing great. It's the uh, night before Thanksgiving. Got a pot of elk chili rolling, ready to eat it here nice. after we finish this. And yeah, it's, uh, life nice. is good. Any other wild <laughs> any other wild game on the menu for Thanksgiving? Uh, not for me, Russ. Um, probably not. We're going to go to some, uh, some families. Um, we actually have some elk lasagna in the oven right now. I s- smelt it as I ran in the door, so we're going to have to hurry here. Just <laughs> yeah, let's speed this up before that kills you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. So Russ, we wanted to dive into several topics. It was kind of funny. I was jotting down some questions the other day and then I sent Steve an email and said, hey, we got this podcast with Russ coming up. Be thinking of some things you want to ask him and kind of what we talk about and things like that. And Steve's reply was pretty funny, and I'm sure you'll get a kick out of it, Russ. Um, but, but Steve says, yeah, I really just want to know why he's so successful. He's literally the <laughs> most successful hunter I know, and it's not just himself. Even when he takes people out with him, they always kill animals. <laughs> <laughs> so big kudos to you, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been I've been blessed that way. I always enjoy uh, putting smiles on people's faces and being, especially part of someone's first. That's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, but I've been I've been blessed for sure. Yeah. Um, and one thing I'll say is I appreciate you guys asking me to be on uh, on the podcast here. But no, it's gonna be good. So that said, talking about your success, let me throw a giant curveball to start the conversation. You know, one thing that. Steve and I are always interested in is how people are still continuing to learn, continue to grow. You know, you've been hunting for what, 30 plus years and obviously have had a ton of success. So what's one thing right now um, that you're kind of working on, maybe improving or a lesson that you've learned even this season after all these years, what are you still learning or working on? Um, you know, obviously a big aspect to, to any hunting, especially the hunting that I, thrive to 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 be a part of um is you know just the physicality side of it um and as i get older especially you know every year i'm kind of reminded i'm 47 now but um the last few years you're kind of reminded of age and recovery and things like that so uh that's probably the bigger thing but i think the biggest thing this year is I've really come to the reality of I control how many years I have left, right? Yeah. Uh, just like when I was running tonight, I just felt, I mean, some days I feel like I'm 25. So, <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> keeping, that, keeping that mindset, I think, right. is uh, a huge key. And as of late, um, I just kind of been reflecting on that. Um, obviously, with the physicality, it allows me to do the kind of lo- the hunting I love to do. You know, anymore, I don't, I don't scout for critters. I don't scout for size, Obviously, I've done a lot of scouting in my life, and I have my country, but I think uh, it's more about having the physicality to get away to have a quality hunt. Yeah. Despite the numbers or quality of critters, it's more about getting away from folks to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what is what is kind of training or physically preparing for hunting look like for you? Uh, a, a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Um I like to, tr- I mean, I, I'm pretty habitual in my workouts, um, but I do try to mix it up just from pack workouts. Um, 
to uh, weight training. I think weight training is still very important. And then, of course, cardio. So it's kind of a matter of tonight, for example, I probably did 360 reps of chest, tries, and shoulder and ran three miles. Um, I, I, I'm, I try to be more aware of my knees. Like this spring, uh, in fact, Steve came out. We were doing some heavy pack, you know, hundred pound bags, uh, yeah. concrete, whatever. And we're doing these tr trudges and I'm a pretty competitive dude and like to push in the last half mile. I'm like jogging with a hundred pounds. So I blew my hips out and it cost <laughs> me like eight months of misery and Jeez. kicking myself in the butt. So I've learned to, uh, modify that to the best of my ability, but I would say a mixed, you know, of weight training, cardio, and of course, preparing your hips for that heavy load. You can be in great shape, but you can also get on a hunt and, and shoot a bull or your buddy shoots a bull the first day and you blow your hips out for four days because you, your body just wasn't prepared for that weight. So, you know, the full gamut of, 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 uh, different exercises, I think is super important. Yeah. So by, by, um, talking about preparing the hips for packouts, is that in your mind, just a matter of, uh, training with weight, hiking with weight and sort of progressively, increasing weight in a smart way and um, just getting your hips used to that function or is there yeah. something else yeah well with me i made a mistake the very first bull i shot with the bow and most people might push the bs button but people that know me know i'm honest the first bull i shot with the bow was a pretty fair ways in i was solo backpacked in this was in 1991 and uh i carried the whole boned out elk out with my camp now i buried my cans of chili and whatever extra stuff that i didn't need to pack out at that time but that blew my hips out for a few years i had issues and uh so i was always conscious of my hips so it would be you know as i've gotten older too more stretching hips more hip stretching and flexing mm -hmm. and then yeah just gradual build up um you know 40 pounds 60 pounds 80 pounds um 100 pounds um and being smart about it, like I said. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So let's transition to that one aspect that we kind of touched on before, and that's uh, taking people out and hunting. I, I just think it's awesome. I mean, I've witnessed it, you know, just from seeing your pictures on Instagram or other guys posting pictures hunting with you. I mean, I just think it's so cool that somebody who's spent so much time in the field is willing to, I mean, from what I see as an outsider, almost mentor some younger guys whether that's obviously your kids which we could talk about some of their hunts or just even some of the guys i've seen you hunt with is that something that you made a conscious effort to get these people out in the field and kind of help them or how did that just kind of come to be uh, re referring to years past or as a whole or this year or yeah just in general um yeah just in general well <clears throat> yeah I, I mean obviously i love i love hunting and, and being an aspect being a part of uh, uh, just being there, obviously, with my boys, um, uh, that's been a real blessing. You know, I'm very motivated to get my boys out. It's funny, though, because even Jess, who's a little killer, I mean, he's taken like 12 big game animals now. He's only like 15, but he, he's not he's not one tenth into it like I was at his age. So sometimes it's a little frustrating. But anyway, um of course, I like taking him, for example, this year, Luke, my 13-year-old, this was his first year of big game hunting. I never pushed him. I was always bit my tongue and tried to be patient because I knew I didn't want to push him. Um, and we backpacked in and had a blast. He shot his first deer, and obviously, I was on a high, and uh, his memories will always talk about. Um, but uh, as far as taking other people, um, yeah, obviously, I enjoyed it. It's always kind of been a random thing. Um with some people, honestly, I kind of have reservations um, because I think it can hurt some people to some degree. And I think some people might not, I, I shouldn't say appreciate it, not that I'm looking for some sort of appreciation, um, but it is a different deal when you work your butt off or something and spend years and years and years to figure something out versus someone taking you somewhere, for example, into a blind and saying, sit here, and then here comes a deer and you shoot it. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a head game I play with myself sometimes. I mean, um, no matter what I enjoy spending time with friends and, 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 and new people, it's like this year, kind of out of the blue, uh, 
uh, a gal named Shannon just contacted me about me with her hunt. She's new from Washington and just a super neat gal. And I uh, just felt like I wanted to help her. And her husband's in medical school, couldn't get her out. And someone just told me that, yeah, she's, I'll help her. And it ended up, I just said, hey, come with me and my boys. And uh, we had an amazing time. In an hour, all three of them shot their bucks the first morning. <laughs> and, wild. you know, we had three XO packs stuffed. In fact, Shannon's XO pack, when I brought it out, was 80 pounds. And we're talking three serious? miles in rough country. She's tough. But anyway, I really get a kick. I really got a kick out of that. Just, and she's a super good, neat person. So, so she just contacted you online then? And kind of, well, it was kind of through, through a mutual friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We don't want to have like, you know, 3,000 people contacting you now. To, <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah, I heard exactly. the podcast. Take me to your honey hole. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's wild yeah. that they all three got on that quick. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Uh, I was I was actually honestly a little bit disappointed in Jess because I was really looking forward to him uh, packing in with me and doing some, some bow hunting. And he got caught up in the heat of the moment, I think, and actually used Shannon's buck as a rest to shoot his buck. So it was kind of no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just happened. Oh. Jess, Luke, and I were on a different ridge, and I mean, bullets were flying. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious, man. It was fun, but I guess to answer your question, I, I obviously I enjoy helping people and and being a part of success, and and I, and I and I am blessed. You know, there's I you know I could take a lot of folks hunting and and get them get them get them opportunities now obviously they still got to seal the deal but yeah um i'm lucky to be able to do that you yeah know? so while you're talking about jess i was just you know recalling a hunt that i got to see um that was on the full draw film tour this past year that was jess right yeah yeah that was my oldest he was 14 then yep yeah so for those who maybe didn't catch the tour can you kind of give us a the brief story on that hunt because it's pretty cool to see it go down. Yeah, I guess in short, um, from a young age, Jess Jess would tag along with me. He'd video some of my hunts before uh, uh, he could hunt. I uh, one occasion I drew unit eighteen. Um, took him up after a football game. The first time he heard an elk bugle, he literally teared up. Uh, I knew he had a passion for it. Uh, later that day, I called a bull in. He actually saw it coming in. I, I got to full draw on it. It stepped out at eight yards, and Jess is in my ear saying, shoot it, Dad, shoot it, Dad. And I didn't shoot, kind of one of my regrets. I had a friend coming for a multi-day hunt, and I uh, opted not to shoot. Um, and it turns out, the loop we did, we were like less than a quarter of a mile for the truck. So my little nine-year-old could have packed some meat and would have been, you know, either way I could tell he was pretty hip. Well, yeah, you know, obviously once he turned 12, he has Hunter's education done well actually at nine, but from 12, 12 to 12 and 13, the stars just didn't align with my work, um, with my schedule for, uh, 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 an archery elk hunt. Now he had, he had shot antelope, uh, with his bow bears, uh, he shot a couple uh, mule there with his gun, uh, but last 2014 was the first year where I just decided I'm I'm not gonna, you know, nothing's gonna get in my way of getting Jess out on an elk. So we backpacked into one of my my one of my spots. Originally we were gonna go over out of eastern Idaho, and uh, I was sitting there one night looking over maps, and something just kind of came over me. I was looking through some stuff, and I pull out this old map and lots of notes on it and just beat up and just took me back to an area that I just loved. Um, I hunted it for 12 years. I never saw a person and, um, shot a lot of elk in there. Well, the wolves decimated it. And for whatever reason, I hadn't, I hadn't been in there in about four or five years because of that. Um, I'm looking at that map and I'm thinking, I'm going to take just there. It's, it's, it was, you know, just a special place. Long story short, um, I brought him in to talk to him about it. I said, it's going to be a backpack hunt. It's not going to be easy. We're going to, you know, work for it, so on and so forth. And he was all up for it. And fortunately that year we had a cameraman up to that point. I had, I had self-filmed all of Jess's hunts, every one of them. Uh, every one of his hunts had been on, I filmed. And so he could, something he could show his grandkids. But Bryce was filming. I was stoked about that. Um, I knew right away it was going to be different. Um, up to that point, the filming took a lot away from my experience with my son. I know it did. So I was just, I was excited about that too. Long story short, we backpacked in. The boys were beat up. They weren't super happy. I was ahead of them on the trail. I hit what I called the bugle stump, which is about a quarter mile 
before camp. Now from camp in the mornings, I get up and walk down a quarter mile and I call and I, that tells me which way I'm going for the day. And I got to there and I just kind of looked up the stars and just overwhelming kind of home feeling and a bowl of bugles. And that was the answer for, that was the, the message from God. You're in the right spot, buddy. You made the right <laughs> choice. So we listened to Buse, Bulls Bugle throughout the night. Um, Zach was, or, or, or uh, Bryce was sick the first day. Jess and I had a great solo day. Called a few bulls, you know, hiked, 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 put some pretty good, you know, boot boots on the ground. Called in a nice bull, um, which ended up being the bull I ended up hunting and taking, you know, nine days later. But long and short of it was, it was a little bit later in the day when we got on him. So following the morning, Jeff, Luke was, or Bryce was feeling better. And we worked up into what I called the bugle stump into a different canyon, called a couple little bulls or two two small bulls and a cow and it just got to full draw. So that was the first time he did that. And he didn't have time to range, wasn't confident in his shot. So he didn't shoot. And we kind of had to, you know, pick your range and sh- make a confident shot. Uh, from there, we went on to what I called the rock and uh, on the way there ate a bunch of huckleberries. But um, once we got to the rock, I got a bugle. Um, just like I have done so many times in years past, uh, Bryce and Jess dropped off and, the bull came across the basin and I was on the backside just calling and, and doing my thing there. And, and I heard something bust out and wasn't sure if it just winded him or what. And it comes sneaking over and I see Bryce coming up the hill and he just giving me the thumbs up and the kind of the motion that just shot. And then I could just hear him say it's down. And I mean, I had a overwhelming emotion come start on my toes and just come up through my head. Like I'd never uh, experienced and, you know, could not help but just cry out loud, which was, you know, it was different. Uh, I see Jess come running up the hill. We meet, we hug. Um, tough to explain that emotion uh, yeah. in detail, but it was, uh, you know, something that I know we'll, we'll never forget. But, you know, above and beyond that, he was tough. We, we packed it out. We made two trips. Uh, uh, I ended up going back the following week. Well, Bryce said, I'm not going back if you don't take horses. So I took my (laughs) horses and uh, uh, got into camp with no rodeos. And and, uh, the next morning, I kind of backdoored that that basin where we had left that bull nine days earlier. And sure enough, he was still in there. Called him right off the mountain, 25 yards, and just put an arrow in him. And that was it. So uh, just (laughs) a... An amazing deal and just so so cool to capture on film and be able to experience that with Jess, not worrying about the stinking camera. Um, but that that's kind of the long and short of it. <laughs> yeah, it was a it's definitely a cool story that you did have on film, though. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. personally for you guys, absolutely. But just even it was a uh, it was awesome to see on the full draw film tour for sure. Yeah, and, and yeah, and obviously to be able to share that the way I look at that. Um, you know, on a personal level, sure, Jess can look at that and, and have pride, and the and the, you know, the the exposure and attention he got from that. Um, obviously, you want your kids to to feel, uh, you know, blessed and important, and so I'll, the whole the whole thing has been has been just uh, yeah, yeah, super cool for sure. So cool. So let's transition to some of the. Um kind of beat potatoes, whether that's tactics or things of that, that have to do with your success. Uh, one thing, I guess, just to get the ball rolling is I've noticed in hearing your stories, you know, you're talking about the rock, um, and the stump and things like that. So you're talking about an area that you know, well, um, that you obviously have history with how important do you think that is for consistent success to kind of stick to an area and really learn that area well? versus, you know, guys who, you know, are maybe hopping around trying to look for a magic spot. What's your what's your thoughts on those two different sort of philosophies? Well, kind of going back to my earlier statement in reference to and I couldn't tell you when I really changed my mentality. <clears throat> it was probably just through experience of getting burned, um, you know, feeling taken advantage of, feeling uh uh, you know, just disappointed and running into people. So I started definitely changing my ways and then just looking into where is somebody not going to want to go, you know? Um, so with that said, for example, my area that I 
elk hunted for so many years, I mean, that is pretty amazing to say I've never seen a bow hunter in that many years and there's one trail and, you know, so I did the right thing by finding that now there's never been any concentration of elk in there. So to talk about your question, those, those nine square miles, I know like the back of my hand, just like this year, I knew exactly where to sit um, to shoot my bull, right? From right. from quite a ways away. Now I shouldn't say that because I set Jess exactly where I thought it was going to happen, and I set back, and the bull did pull a little slipper on me and came forty yards from where I thought he would and bypassed Jess, and I ended up shooting it. So I guess I shouldn't act that cocky, but um, <laughs> yeah. To answer your question, I think it's very vital to know um, um, know the country you're hunting and every inch of it if you can. So. I look at it like I'd rather hunt somewhere where there's a couple elk and no people than 50 elk and five people. Um, because then I feel like it's kind of like who's the lucky one rather than I'm on your, I'm on their terms and it's going to be all me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple kind of follow up thoughts to that. One is when you're talking about finding places, others won't want to go. Um, is that just a matter of, distance in terms of packing in or are there certain uh terrain features that you know you might be wanting to tackle that others won't um what's kind of your thoughts there again obviously without giving away anything but well yeah no um i i think that's a tough question and that comes that that comes with just um traffic obviously um what you hear you know, as, as bow hunters, it's a pretty small community. You can always see pictures. You can always, you know, um, hear stories. Um, and there's certain parts of the country you never hear stories about. Now, obviously we don't know every bow hunter, but we know a lot of successful bow hunters. And the reality is the community is pretty small, especially with social media now. Um, so kind of back in the day, it was more about, um, boots on the ground, you know, Mm-hmm seeing those places on maps back when all you had was topo maps for me and, and going to those places and just stomping them and looking for, you know, old camps, looking for, you know, sign of people, how maintained is the trail? I'll call the forest service. Do you guys maintain this trail every year? Well, no, no, no. You know, obviously I, I do have done a lot of hunting in the McCall zone and with all the fires and all the stuff that's been going on and all the deadfall now, that's kind of a good tool to use as to what trails are being maintained and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's different angles to research than, than, you know, just the typical, I guess. Now, obviously, you can fly around on Google Earth and yeah. <laughs> really check things out. Um, I know we're kind of talking about elk, but like in reference to, to water holes and such for antelope and there's a lot of that's cheating in my opinion. I had to walk it all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, in reference to scouting and looking, unfortunately, I, I I see a kind of a trend of of these of these guys out there when they're scouting. You know, half the time they're not scouting for an animal; they're scouting where successful people hunt, whether it's through pictures and Google Earth and matching, or just you know, asking, researching, Hey, where does this guy hunt? Where does this guy hunt? Do you know where this guy hunts? So what's he drive? I mean, to me, that's, uh, those are folks that really need to readjust their moral, their moral compass and and what their motivation is for hunting. But, um, um, so no matter what, it has to be boots on the ground to really see it. And it needs to be boots on the ground at that time. You know, really, you can go scout all summer and find a lot of elk and, chances are they're going to move a little bit by the time season kicks in and then you're going to really find out how many hunters are in that area so it comes down to time mm-hmm. time time in the country and time with the animals and you know i've been into this almost bow hunting almost 30 years so i was very very motivated and spent more time than anybody i knew probably in the woods um learning you know and i was thoroughly uh, engaged in sleeping with animals, sleeping on the mountain, especially elk, you know, listening to them, um, kind of learning, uh, th- their demeanor, you know? Yeah. That's another story. I'm getting off topic here. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Would you consider yourself a patient hunter? 
an aggressive hunter or maybe a bit of both depending upon the situation yeah yeah um you know and of course talking about species uh Mm -hmm. obviously you know we're talking about a lot of different things i've shot you know I, I, I've learned how to shoot really big bears and that's obviously a patience game. I've climbed in tree stands at six in the morning and climbed out of tree stands at noon the next day, <laughs> just, just so I could hope to see that giant bear as the sun came up. Um, so obviously that's a, I have a lot of patience for that, you know, blind hunting and sitting and, um, and obviously elk hunting, there are times where you need to be very aggressive. Um, but, I would have to say more on the patience yeah. probably as a whole f- in reference to all critters and success. Cause even elk hunting, I'm very patient. I'm not, uh, to get bigger a- age class bulls, there's definitely a different hunt. You're hunting differently, right. Mm-hmm. Then, um, you know, I guess being content, which is great, uh, with, you know, shooting, uh, younger age class, you know, satellite bulls, uh, um, that's another topic too, but patience. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a huge factor of success for me. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're hunting, are you, you, I have a bad habit of like going from point A and point B is in my mind. And I just kind of want to put my head down and get there as fast as I can. And I can't tell you how many opportunities I've blown doing that. Do you, do you still hunt essentially? I mean, being patient when you're out there moving around or, do you kind of hike around and sit and wait and let things develop? What's your strategy there? And are you talking about elk hunting? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I guess elk hunting, um, of course, that would determine if I'm in a you know an area I, I don't know as well or an area I know very well. Mm-hmm. In an area I know very well, um, I'm going to be very patient because in my mind, I already know where the elk are. Or, you know, they're either going to be, you know, in one of seven places, whatever that number may be, or one of four places. So I know how to approach those areas. I know how to um, um, hunt them, I guess. So I guess to answer your question, and I know what you're saying, you know, you run by opportunity in a sense, you know, kind of, gosh, nothing's here at A, we got to run to B and all of a sudden you're cruising and you're blowing out elk. Um, Again, my strategy probably is more that I'm going to be finding a bull that's going to bugle, right? Um, Mm -hmm. In a sense that I, as far as an age class bull, right? Maybe whether it's a bull that has cows or whatever, and of course it depends on the time of year, but with my experience, Age class bulls are always going to bugle more, you know, and maybe a little bit later in the day, um, especially if they have cows. And not necessarily full on bugle, but I'm going to be patient. I do a lot of hunting like after 10 o'clock because mm-hmm. you kind of know fairly quickly how aggressive that bull is. So if I know I'm not going to just call them in, I'm just going to pretty much kind of clam up and, and, and keep keep in contact with him the best I can with really low impact. And then I'm going to wait for him to bed and then I'm going to sneak in on him. So I've shot a lot of bulls that way, just sneaking right in on the herd or maybe. Oh, really? Just, just shutting up and sneaking in there. Yep. 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 So I've done that a lot, especially a little bit later in the season, early on. Um, I have pretty good luck calling, you know, the, the, the bigger bulls, but you know, after the second week, um, I'll do a lot of stalking. Yep, because it is tough. It's tough to yeah. pull those bulls away from cows. Yeah, and which which is awesome. That's exciting. I've belly crawled and spent you know two hours forty yards from a herd of elk, and the bulls just laying there over the little thing. And lots of times they blow out, and I don't get to get it. But uh, when the times arise and the bull stands up just perfect, and you hammer him, it's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? Yeah. In those scenarios, I'm curious, are you hunting more open country where you um, have a visual or a pretty good idea of the exact location? Or, I mean, one thing I struggle with with elk hunting in those scenarios is really understanding um, when I'm hearing elk and trying to 
pinpoint uh, their location in terms of distance, elevation, things like that to mm-hmm. be able to get in as close as possible. How do you approach that? You know, you're staying in contact, you're sort of ready to shut up, you're going to make the move to stalking close to the herd and hopefully right. sneak in there quiet. I mean, what's what are some of maybe the tricks or experiences that you've learned <laughs> well, from there? Yeah, that's, that's going to go back to knowing the country that you're in, you know, like... Mm-hmm. Um, it's just time in that area. Yeah. It, it, it is best. Now, obviously, if you're in an area that you're not as familiar with, you're just going to kind of keep working in. Um, and, you know, sure, there's going to be times that maybe you will have to give a bugle to try to get them to answer if you're just kind of hands are tied. But there's plenty of times where I'm just going to sit down and I sit down for an hour. And then all of a sudden, you hear a small growl. You know, those herd bulls just like to talk. Um whether it's a super soft, whatever, and I'm there to listen and catch it. And then I'm going to move in a little bit more. Um, no, obviously, you know, obviously it's not a perfect world and sometimes I lose them, but it's important for, for, to have the mentality that there's no, and again, I'm in areas, I'm pretty sure there's no other people. So I know in my head, there's no, there's no reason that elk left. He's yeah. not, he's there. I know he's there. I'm just going to work in, you know, outside of his kitchen a little bit, but I'm going to be there as soon as I hear something. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, that's important. I think a lot of people will call an elk and call an elk. And a lot of times it'll be the herd bull bugling. They'll call in a satellite bull. It busts them. It goes blowing out and they think they just blew it or a bull just flat quits calling, you know, later in the morning. And they're just like, what happened? Oh, I don't know, man, he's gone. He just left. I don't know what, geez, let's go. Let's go back and get a beer and have some lunch. You know, I mean, there's no, <laughs> it didn't go anywhere. It's there. Right. So that's important to always have in your brain. I always think that bull is right there. It's right. You know what I mean? Plus yeah. I'm, a, I'm a pretty, pretty positive type person. One of those wake up, it's going to happen today. It's going to happen today. And I think that's important too, you know, to have that yeah. fire, fire and confidence, um, and yeah. Patience, yeah. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to hit on that was, was just approaching the day with, with confidence and, and optimism that you're going to, you know, the, it's going to happen today, you know, and versus the pessimistic, you know, attitude of, man, this is really hard. We just got to get lucky and, um, start oh, questioning so, yeah. yourself and yeah. yeah, question every move you make. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Yep. And that's, that's a huge, that's a whole nother, you know, topic when you talk about mentality and expectations and, you know, putting pressure on yourself, whether it's social media pressure, whether it's, you know, industry pressure. I mean, that's such a huge topic. Um, Mm -hmm. You need to go into the bow hunting or hunting woods with a positive attitude, with a, with an idea of adventure and, 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 and enjoying the whole process and, you know, a dead animal at the end of the hunt is just a bonus, right? Um, obviously, I learned that through the years. Early on, I was more competitive and I was driven, and yeah, I just, you know, <laughs> I don't, I didn't care. I was going to get an animal. As you get older, you get this, you know, it's not as important. But fortunately, I've uh, learned through the years how to be successful, and um, it's. Uh, I'm never going to say it's easy because it still takes work, but really what it is in the end is all the years I've spent, you know, sleeping with elk, sleeping on the mountain, watching critters, watching movement, learning, you know, patterns and corridors, uh, learning habits of bears and what the big bears do versus the the little bears do. And, uh, uh, you know, antelope's kind of antelope. You got to get into an area where there's, you know, not the pressure and you can get some age class and you can get good antelope bucks with a, you know, consistent setup and all those things but <clears throat> reference to like elk and maybe stalking mule deer and things like that it, it, it there's no right or wrong it's an intuitive reaction to the situation you know everybody asks me well how do you get on on big bulls well it seems to me like over the last lot of years if i look back even at the last like four four or five bulls i've shot i've pretty much shot them the first day i've hunted them maybe the second and it's kind of weird to think about that but it's like i've just gained like an intuitive reaction to the situation you know and the mm-hmm. only reason i did that was through time spent with elk it's the only mm-hmm. thing i can put my finger on 
because I can't, it's hard to explain. Right. right? How do you explain to somebody why'd you make that choice? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, because people <laughs> ask me, why have you killed so many elk? And they're all pretty nice, you know? Yeah. I, that's, that's about all I can say, I think, is just uh, get out, love it, learn it, spend time with them, have zero expectation, and don't let the industry or other people affect your, your uh, experience. Um, one of the most important things I tell everybody. The only way to learn how to kill something with a bow is to kill something with a bow. <laughs> so, so when you have that opportunity, I don't care if it's a doe or a spike or a cow early on, um, start putting some meat on the table. Because when that big buck or antelope or elk down the road is standing there, you're going to know how to kill it. You know, Control some of those emotions of, of uh, sending an arrow through the boiler room, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, we- we talk a, lot about of, that. A, lot of, a lot of factors. We talk about that quite a bit of just kind of having that killer instinct of that, you know, that a lot of people can get within 50 to 100 yards, but more often than not, you screw that up. Um, and it seems guys like you, somehow 80% of the time you seem to make that situation happen. Um, and so just it, experience and time in the field is, is your kind of best advice of figuring out what to do in those heat of the moment situations. Yeah. Um, I mean, and you touched on that too, is capitalizing on your opportunity. Um, Mm -hmm. Everybody, for the most part, you know, you hear the story all the time of I missed or gosh, I had that giant buck at this distance or I called this bull in and I tried to draw and blew him out. Well, yeah, I'm not probably different in the sense of, of opportunity. Um, but I think through time I've learned again how to make the right choices, whether it's drawing or pre-drawing or, you know, slow, slow movement. I've learned what I can and can't get away with where someone, you know, newer um, doesn't quite know what they can and can't get away with. And the only way to learn that is through experience going back to time in the field and time with that specific animal. So it all comes kind of down to time and working hard and experience. Um, And again, yeah, capitalizing on your opportunity. I'm a guy that, pretty much shoots his bow almost every day now i work from home that's what gets my butt off my off my chair i open my back door and shoot a few arrows at 40 and um obviously practice is a big component of of body reaction in that moment and it just happens and your muscle memory is there from practicing versus guys that just pull their bow out you know a week before season and wonder why they hit it in the butt you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> but capitalizing on the opportunity and putting the, all the odds in your favor to do so are obviously huge and mm-hmm. not making excuses is a huge, huge thing. I try to talk with people. I don't know how many times you hear the story. I called the bull in. Gosh, dang, he came in. I didn't have time to range him. I thought he was 20. I shot him for 30 and shot over his back. And you're like, that's not possible. And you're really making yourself look dumb because you're talking about a two inch or three inch difference in height. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Too many folks are are not honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about, and I think of a lot of it's just pressure, and they don't want to feel bad, and they they uh, rather than just saying I really screwed up, fell apart, buck fever got the best of me, and I freaking blew it, dropped my bow arm, and shot it in the hoof or whatever, versus uh, kind of making excuses. I mean, I know guys that I started bow hunting with way back when, and they've still yet to take a couple animals. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's excuse after excuse after excuse. Kind of a life lesson you learn anyway, whether it's bow hunting or whatever. It can really hold a factor of (laughs) success or not success, you know. So it's about being honest and learning what you need to do to Mm. learn from your mistakes. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's absolutely that's an interesting key point, too, because. Even if you're, I mean, if you're the guy making uh, mistakes, but then making excuses about it, I think you begin to maybe believe your own excuses. And so you don't fully feel the weight of, um, no, I just fought up, blew it, and need to get better. Or I fought up, blew it, and need to fix this. You're not doing that, and you're not going to fix it, because I think you're believing your own excuse. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've seen it for, I've trust me, that's real. <laughs> yeah. So what other thing? I mean, I know you mentioned that it's kind of hard for you to maybe talk about specifics of why did you do that or why do you do that because it's instinct. Um, and that makes sense. 
So let's maybe look at it from a different way. What are some of the mistakes between, you know, beyond the few things we just mentioned with shooting, for example, what are some of the mistakes you see most often um, that keep people from being successful or that keep people from, you know, closing the distance and, uh, you know, making the kill? Oh, <clears throat> um, well, I think there's a lot of factors. Um, obviously we touched on kind of the not being honest with yourself, um, not, not preparing yourself, uh, you know, in, 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 in physical practice, obviously in physicality, um, obviously if you're, if you're beat down physically, it makes it that much harder to, you know, with your cognitive and your physicality to, to even get into that situation of success. Um, uh, obviously we talked about being honest with yourself. Um, and I, I guess, are you asking in the heat of the moment, like blowing an opportunity? Yeah. I mean, just kind of the difference, you know, between those guys who, um, do you capitalize on the vast majority of their opportunities versus the guys who, you know, tend to blow yeah, things? Yeah, it's kind of I the, mean, the saying that, yeah, uh, you know, 10% of the hunters, seems like especially bow hunters, get 90% of the animals, right? right. Um, which I think is, you know, tr tr true to some degree. Um, and I think it just comes down to personalities and tenacity, you know? Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, time. Time is a big factor. You know, I, I obviously committed to being a bow hunter and and, and, and and made my life in the sense of working for myself and, and giving myself, you know, time. Not that I really actually had that much time running my business at a construction company for a lot of years before that, working here and there. And crap, I'd quit jobs if they didn't let me go elk hunting. <laughs> you know? So, so um but I had enough time. You always got time. And the time I did have, I was in the woods, you know, yeah. I, was, I was learning and I was shooting and I was shooting competitive archery and it really has been my life. And mm -hmm. there's no substitute for that. I should be successful right mm -hmm. now. Um, obviously there's a lot of people that, you know, have other hobbies, you know, whether it's mountain bike racing or motorcycle racing or jet skiing, skiing, all those things. Well, Pretty. I mean, I motors. I raced bikes and stuff for a number of years, but uh, for the most part, I am a bow hunter. So that played a huge role. And I think those guys that are very successful are similar to me, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of is their. Um, I guess in some ways you could say identity. It's who they are. It's what they're about, you know. And I, I definitely fall in that category as a, you know, freak bow hunter. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, you know, go ahead. Oh, uh, go ahead, Russ, and I'll ask a question. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, uh, you know, the guys that can capitalize on opportunity are guys that uh, can control their emotion. Um, that comes back to being honest with yourself. That comes back to going through those processes of, at that moment of truth, consciously being able to squeeze your trigger and watch that arrow fly into the animal. Now, um, do I think those people, I imagine there are people out there that can draw and hold on an animal as if it was a three-dimensional target, you know? Um, that's not me by any means. I think if I ever got to that point that I would probably quit or just help people, you know, take mm -hmm. people. Um, you know, there's no situations where, with elk, I'm more calm than anything, um, but, you know, I still have that buck fever and bull fever. I've just learned through time how to control it probably better than most, right? right. Um, consciously at that time when I have my pin on my animal, am I going to hit that animal and executing a good shot? I mean, sometimes it's a little bit better than others. Sometimes you kind of react. But again, through reaction shooting, whether it's a mule deer running by like in last year's full draw film tour, and I had to just – see it through one hole, swing through and shoot it again. That became instinctive, but I shoot all the time. Not nearly like I used to, but I shoot enough to have that, that, that muscle memory, right? Yeah. And accuracy. But anyway, 
Mm. Well, I, 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 it was kind of a broad question, and I'm kind of rambling around. But what were you going to ask, Steve? Um, I was going to. Do you kind of? I have some friends that I consider like hyper focused hunters that sun up to sun down. It is like just focused, right? And then and they're very successful. And I have other friends who are very just kind of almost lackadaisical lazy. Like they just like kind of take their time and, and they find to be successful as well. And I was wondering where you classify yourself uh, on that. Um, definitely early on and for many years, I was very hyper-focused, mm-hmm. hyper. I mean, one example. Now I will drive to my antelope blind and park my four-wheeler on the other side of the dike on one of my antelope blinds or within 100 yards of it in a little d- Cooley. Years ago, I wouldn't even drive my four wheeler on top of that flat. I'd have my pack, my cooler, my chair, and I would walk through the darkness across the desert for two and a half miles because I didn't want one antelope to see my headlight or hear my four wheeler. <laughs> That's how freak over the top I was back then. Uh-huh. You know, elk hunting, I, I never made a peep. I, I probably wasn't super fun to hunt with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, you know, over the top. I was the guy that it's like, holy crap, Russ, why do you always have to do things the hard way? <laughs> it's just like, I get more out of it. I mean, I'm still like that. I'm still the guy. I would still rather backpack in four miles, shoot a 150 inch buck. Right. Any day of the week than be driving down the, you know, South Fork Road and have a 200 inch bunk jump across the road and me jump out of the car and shoot it. I would shoot that 150 inch deer every day before I shoot that 200 incher from the road. That's just, who I yep. am, right? Um, um, so now I'm getting off track. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Hyperfo- hyperfocus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I used to be very hyperfocused. Am I still? I still am to some degree, but I got to be honest. Just this week, I was kind of talking about that to one of my friends uh, when we were up on the hill. It was just. It was kind of nice not to be that. It was kind of nice. I had a, a friend client uh, call me. He's just kind of, you know, going through some problems and he needed somebody there. And I said, hey, man, come on up. We'll go. And we really didn't end up turning into a hunt. It ended up turning into just a couple of days of visiting and hot springs and hanging out. And I was kind of reflecting on how nice it was I could actually freaking do that. You know, where before I couldn't. So uh-huh. I used to be, I still am to some degree, but I've definitely uh, mellowed out. And I was successful then, and I'm successful now. Mm-hmm. Now I've just, I'm, I've learned how to be successful, so I don't have to be as hyper, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, cool. But I'm a guy that's still going to go hard, you know. I'm yeah. still going to. If yep. I see something that, that I want to get after, I'm still going to be willing to say, you know, I don't care. Let's go rather than, mm-hmm. wow, that looks steep, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kind of related to the, almost what you got or what you hit, hit it on. There was hyper-focused guy. It's just like, it's almost not fun. It's I, yeah. I'm going to kill an animal. I, I will sacrifice whatever I'm going to have it. And then the other guys like, I'm going to enjoy this experience, soak it in. And like I, said, I have friends on both ends of the spectrum of, and they're both extremely successful. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to learn from other people because, you know, when I was 18, I was a terrible hunter. Uh, and I'm always learning and, and just curious how, how, you know, what you attributed yourself to. Yeah. Um, it really all comes down to time and persistence and, uh, yeah being honest and going hard and making those choices and you end up making choices based on history. And I think anybody that uh, spends the time in the woods and is open-minded and honest with themselves, they're going to learn and they're going to continue to be a better, more successful hunter period, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, or you can get caught up in the industry and worry and stress and, and beat yourself up over not, shooting that big animal or whatever it may be. And it's just going to ruin it for you anyway. So uh, it's all about the experience, man. You know, (laughs) I mean, (laughs) and I love it. You know, I've been, I've been doing it hard for most all my, most my life. Um, And I still love it today. Like I, like I loved it then, which um, I feel blessed. I mean, I remember 
I was thinking about when you, you, we, we were talking about this. I don't know why it came to my brain, but even at the time I was little, I remember my dad gave me a Fred Bear Little Bear recurve when I was nine or ten. And I can just remember sitting on rock piles at the old penitentiary waiting for those rock chucks to come out. And I finally killed one with that little – I mean, I didn't kill it. It just stuck in its neck, and I was able to spend five hours digging it out of the hole and clubbed it with a rock. But I got that <laughs> rock chuck with that little recurve, and I can remember it, you know. Um, those are the memories I had. So I was, I've was i always been a freaking bow hunter, mm. you know. <laughs> and that's important, obviously. If you're doing it for the wrong reasons, um, you – you might not be have the success that, that that you think you should have. You know, I think a lot of people maybe are kind of involved, uh, trying maybe for a little bit of the wrong reasons, whether it's notoriety or mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Um, um, you know, where the main they, they might not be bow hunters. You know, I think there are bow hunters, and I think there are folks that are bow hunting that maybe aren't bow hunters. But it's all fun, and obviously. With me, I'm a I'm a Christian. I'm a religious guy, so I I give my you know the the overall glory and success and all that stuff to God. So uh, I've been lucky. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So let's uh, transition a little bit while we have a, a little bit of time left here. And you know, yeah. you've talked about clients and things like that, and mentioned um, that in passing, just tell us a, a bit about your work with outdoors international, kind of what that is and, and what you do with them. Yeah. Yeah. As a company, um, I guess, uh, I don't know if, as far as history, um, you know, 2008 rolled around and I had a construction company. I was quickly reminded that I didn't have life figured out. Uh, you know, in turn, uh, my partner, and I dissolved the company really took it hard, uh, had some assets out there that, uh, you know, kind of buried us. Long story short, uh, we dissolved the company and I was just kind of in limbo and I was approached by Outdoors International. Corey had uh, uh, started it a number of years before that, but he was busy with his full-time job. It was kind of a dream deal. And uh, um, he, he later brought on Mark who then a few months later contacted me, recruited me to come work with them. And then as time went on, they brought me on as a, uh, uh, as a co-owner. So that's kind of the, the background on it. But as a company, we're basically the guys folks come to, to, uh, uh, look for the hunts that, of, of, you know, of their dreams, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and we're here to kind of, you know, get to know guys, to the best of our ability, talk about options, understand who they are as people from physicality, obviously to budget, to what kind of hunter are you really looking for? You know, is a horse hunt, backpack, you know, float trip, whatever it may be. Um, and talk about those options and, you know, do the best job we can to align those guys with the right outfitters. As far as our outfitters, it's always a multi-year process of getting to know them, building a trust, to the point of sending someone to hunt with them, whether it's us or our scout hunters or maybe a client, um, to go and see if they are who they say they are. And, um, you know, from that point, the relationship grows. Obviously, we have to build a trust in, in them and in them and us. Um, and in the end, it's a good deal. Uh, our service is free to our clients and that there's no, you know, additional fees attached to it. We're basically reimbursed out of the marketing budget of our outfitters. Um, and our outfitters are accountable. They want our guys to come back to us with good reports and we're accountable to, uh, send folks with realist, realistic expectations and, and preparedness. Um, but obviously it's hunting, you know, yeah, uh, it, it's tough. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, I, I, I care a lot. I, uh, obviously have come to realize that there's no perfect hunts. And, and I explain that to folks, there really isn't. Um, so you expect those, those hardships and those roadblocks. And, um, I mean, no different than Steve and Lenny and, and Jason and Tyler's moose hunt. It was a tough freaking deal. I take that, 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 that to heart, I obviously was a completely different experience than I had, but mm-hmm. you know, I learned from it and, uh, have made those changes uh, to make it better. But anyway, yeah, as a company, we do. We take pride in what we do and um, here to help. And we're going to, you know, we offer everything from just unguided drop type elk hunts, you know, and uh, for the for the DIY type guy all the way to, you know, 
Ibex in Kyrgyzstan. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, you got to travel pretty much around the world doing some different hunts, one of those being that Kyrgyzstan hunt. Yeah, yeah, I've been blessed that way. You know, um, <clears throat> it's having the opportunity to see parts of the world I, I just wouldn't have done. You know, personally, um, I would have a hard time justifying, you know, some of the costs to see some of those things. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the fact is I'm very satisfied with my bow shooting you know, carp and rock chucks. So, so obviously when we have a lot here to hunt in Idaho, but having the opportunity, yeah. Uh, like you said, Steve, I've, I've taken, taken group to Kyrgyzstan and it was pretty surreal pinching myself in the butt standing at 15,000 feet, looking into China thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. So <laughs> we are really blessed that way. Obviously we get a lot of people. It's like, Hey, how do I get your job? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, it's it's been fun building a company, uh, help build, helping build a company with with Mark and Corey, and we're always going through changes and trying to improve as a company, and we're doing it, you know, kind of, you know, grassroots. Corey's the the the, the tech stud. Um, he obviously drives the leads, and uh, we've got a you know three or four other agents now working for us, and uh, just really good guys, and everybody cares what by what they do, and. It's it's been a fun ride that way. I definitely don't miss swinging a hammer. I can I can say that, and I think we're going to continue to grow leaps and bounds every year, which we have um, from the beginning. So, you have any specific questions on what we do? You kind of get the the gist of it. I mean, I'm basically a we're hunting consultants and here to help uh, facilitate your hunting needs. Basically, also we you know offer some you know uh, river rafting, you know wing shooting and fishing. We're expanding more into that. Uh, we're here to help. Godhunts.com. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm sure there's a ton we could talk about. Probably a whole nother show, but yeah, um, certainly, guys, if you have any questions, just go ahead and get in contact with the crew. As Russ just mentioned, Godhunts.com. And as you said, Russ, it's pretty much almost any species you can think of and different hunting styles, whether that's DIY, fully guided, and all the above. So, yeah, I mean, that's a vast offering for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and like I said, we're we're there through the process. Um, you know, before the hunt, after the hunt, um, we want to hear about it. We want to try to improve. We want to hold each other and our outfitters accountable. We want to we want to offer the best service we can. Um, yeah. So yeah, cool. So beyond uh, godhunts dot com and learning about Outdoors International, how can uh, our listeners kind of follow you, get to know you and, uh, you know, see pictures of critters and everything else. Cause we know you're getting ready to head out again, uh, here in a few days. So what's the best way to kind of stay in contact with you and see what's going on with Russ? Um, as far as like, you know, social media. Yeah. Oh, oh as a whole. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, Long story short, I took, uh, me and a friend took, uh, Travis Brown, uh, who is, uh, like the number three or number five heavyweight, MMA heavyweight. In fact, we got him set up with PAX and, and, uh, Cryptek. And anyway, long, long story short, uh, uh, he, Travis and Zach and, uh, had been hounding me to get a Instagram account going. So I finally go, I, I've been kind of anti, um, social media stuff but anyway so i'm on instagram uh r meyer archery um so i'm starting to post some stuff there and it, it is kind of fun you know i enjoy obviously looking at hunting photos and and seeing some of those stories and i've 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 uh i've come to enjoy and, and meet some neat people so it's pretty fun networking that way as long as you don't get carried away yeah but uh yeah as far as uh getting in touch with the company yeah it's just got hunts.com um you can definitely go to uh, uh, a link there to get my direct contact information off the website. But um, I'm here to help in any way that way. Cool. You know, hey, funny Russ. about my job. One day I'm a one day I'm a honey consultant. One day I'm a counselor. One day I'm a coach. Uh, <laughs> so my job is, uh, and, and you know, I enjoy that. So uh, all those years of talking hunting on the phone geared me up for this position because that's really the reality of my job is I'm at my desk pretty much every day talking hunting, um, which isn't all that bad, but, uh, <laughs> it's fun uh, to get out 
<laughs> hey, uh, so you mentioned earlier, I got Russ and I, he invited me out to do a workout earlier this spring and I, I got to go after the workout because I met him at his house. He, he showed me his shop and Mark, it's the shop is nothing but antlers. And I'm just like, he's just like, yeah, bokeh, 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 bokeh. And it's, ridiculous. <laughs> it's three walls of, of antlers. And it's, it's, Quite the pretty much the most impressive thing I think I've ever seen. And yeah, they're all his all his kills, all bow kills. Um, yeah, it's the, I yeah. call it my rack shack. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, do you know how many animals you have in there? I mean, and I'm, I doubt you're the type of guy that keeps exact counts of things. Yeah, but, I uh, don't. I I don't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got. It, a, it's got to be a hundred plus animals. That I mean. Well, past yeah, that. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, realistically, you know, we had I had this conversation a while back, and I'm I'm realistically somewhere 110 to 115 animals with my bow. Yeah, you know, not to say whatever, no. but oh um, yeah, it's it's, it's just, just but yeah, and it is fun. You know, the, the rack shack is someplace because uh, I I kind of like to be alone, you know, a fair mm-hmm. bit, and just in my thoughts, and it's always enjoyable just to kind of go and sit in there and just, you know, look at a rack and just go back to that hunt and that experience, mm-hmm. you know, um, mm-hmm. that's kind of what they are for me. Do you um, still have a, this is maybe a weird question, but just so curious, do you still, could you look at pretty much all of those animals and kind of even remember even part of a story about most of them? I mean, that's just crazy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they all have a special, you know, something about them. <laughs> yeah. In every situation, whether it's a, uh, you know, the car ride up or that certain, you know, encounter or something. There's always a memory with a horn to me. Um, and it's amazing me too when you talk about horns. Now, I'm not a guy that's intrigued by sheds. By um, now, obviously, as a hunter, you always think how are we so intrigued and freaked out and, and buck fevered by, you know, these horns that grow out of the top of these animals' heads? I mean, I still get that, but more the horn is a memory to me, you know, yeah. um, mm-hmm. not a matter of inches or whatever. It's uh, definitely a memory. Yeah. All about the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're there with you. That's cool to hear that somebody with your – experience and history and success is still all about the experience that's awesome yeah i mean admittedly early on it was different because i was such a competitive person um you know but obviously you like anything you grow up and you kind of start to stop and smell the roses kind of cliche but it's reality um and it's been a nice transition obviously and with my boys it's been a transition over of part of it of a of kind of a starting over which is just awesome you know yeah. you know obviously watching you know being a part of your kids bow kills and watching that boy it's uh it's awesome um it's really cool yeah i can imagine so i always I always feel like you know those videos and such i mean they're cool like i said and great to reflect on um i don't i've never strived for the spotlight in that sense but if I can inspire in any way, you know, if I can get a, a dad to say, you know what, gosh, I am going to take, you know, my son out next week and whatever it is, I, 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 that makes me happy, you know? Yeah. And, and I heard a lot of feedback. I've heard a lot of feedback from, from the full draw film tours, which are just a great group of guys. And I would support 1000%, but, uh, hearing those little stories really makes, puts a smile on my face and, and, uh, you know, and I talked to Jess about that, and he appreciates it too. So it's pretty yeah. cool. Absolutely. Awesome. I mean, I was I was there in the seats and watching, and thinking of my three year old son, and you know, counting down the days and moments, and it was it was inspirational for me. So I I appreciate it personally. Cool. So. Good to hear. Cool, Russ. Well, thanks a ton for your time, man. Um, we really appreciate it. Maybe we'll have to uh, follow up and, and do one again in the future. But thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to chat with us, for sure. No, oh, I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. <laughs>